Hello everyone. Welcome to the fifth program in my series, Bob's Golden Memories. And this time I'm going to take you back to, ah, oh, it was really an exciting time. It was my first ever World Championship win. I've won four and this, this was my first one, you know. And I can't really, I'd like to explain the feeling of the first one and I'll try to get you some of the atmosphere of it as I go through the programme. But uh, anyway, let's go ahead. The, the venue was in, well, it was in, it was, U, it was the former Yugoslavia, now Slovenia. And it was the River Drava and the town was Maribor. And it was fairly, the match length was virtually in the middle of the town. Um, I can't remember whether we flew or drove or, or I, I think we probably, did we drive there? Do you know that, that I'm going back to 1990. So just imagine trying to remember 30, 30 years back. I can remember some of the fishing, but I can never remember, you know, the food and where you, what, what, you, what you had to eat and where you stayed. I only remember the important things, how to catch fish. That's me, isn't it? So we arrived at, uh, at the venue. I honestly don't know whether we drove or, or flew, I don't know. Anyway, we, when we turned up, the first, there was a team already fishing. The Welsh team had got there before us. And we were out, out there about a week before the match started. You could practice and then, and then fish the match at the weekend. So they closed the venue for about one day beforehand. Welsh team right there, Clive Branson, who um, I've got to know quite well over over the series. Really good, typical, you know, they're, they're Welsh, the same as the English, really. So they're brought up on the same sort of fishing. So um, probably, and and they, the Welsh had won the World Championship the year before in Bulgaria. That's probably why they got out there early, thought they were going to win it again. And uh, well, they're a good side anyway, good bunch of lads. Um, and... Uh, it, you know, we got, we got there and we had uh, Tommy Pickering with us. He was part, I'll show you the team in a sec. But he was, um, and he won the individual championship in Bulgaria the year before. So that was 1989. Welsh team had won the team event and Tommy Pickering fresh. And he was still the world champion at that time and was with us. Let me show you the team. Now, I haven't got a picture from that year, so I've got, but we had a picture from the from the second year, which I've already shown you. But there, there on the left is Dick looking at his cap, and the tall lad beside. This is the team. The tall lad beside him is Tommy Pickering, the great Tommy Pickering. Now he was he'd been world champion. The one with his head down, frightened to show you his face, is Dennis White. There's me at the back, as usual, the quiet lad of the mob. Stevie Gardner just laughing, didn't know about whether to put the hat on or not. Then we had uh, Mark Downs next to him, and then right on the end is Kevin, famous Kevin Asher. So that's that was the team. Really good, really good team. Virtually the same as as the year before, uh, and and Tommy, as I said, was world champion. Dick. Richard Clegg was a was the team manager again. Incredible record. Incredible record he had all the way through. There's I took a picture off the internet. This wasn't I hadn't got hardly any pictures from, from the time we were fishing, but they're a bit like what the river looks like. And we were fishing you see where those swans are? Well we were fishing the other bank on the where all those buildings are along that town bank. And I can remember that bridge being there and I can remember Mark Downs drawing. I think there was one or two sections down there. And I can remember Mark being down below the bridge. I can remember I can remember that much. Nice hotel, it was red hot, beautiful. We were there, it was sort of September 1990, really warm, gorgeous weather, early September. Uh, and in fact, it was really hot. Job to keep all the all the bait uh, cool. Anyway, as I said, when we when we got there. We pulled up and the, and the Welsh team were fishing and watching them. And uh, 
and they were catching a few fish, doing well, really. They were, I thought, oh, I would look, looked at the, the river and it was really pacey, fast, and, and you could see it was deep. And it looked and it reminded me just of, of the River Ban in Northern Ireland, which again is a, is a deep, fast flowing river. It reminded me just, I thought, oh, this just looks like the band to me. And Kevin and myself had been fishing the band probably five years all the time. We were on there non-stop really. So we'd, we'd really got to know it, that, that style of fishing, which I'll talk about. Um, so it, it looked good. It was sort of, it was a pacey river, uh, five and a half metres deep, something like that. And, and really fast flowing. It, there was only one method. It was it was deep water. You'd only got ten meters anyway between. This is I'm talking about practice to give give you an idea of the match itself. And so in practice, you could see there's only one method, which was the pole. You couldn't fish a running line at all. It's ten meters. You you're out of your peg before you even start. And because it was so fast, you had to slow the bait down. It was in those days, 1990, no flat floats. Hey, I'll show you the float. Let me show you the float. I, this was the actual float I used in the match. I found, I kept it. I keep some things for ages. There. That's a, sort of like a round bodied. I forget who it was. I bet somebody watching this who fished, fishes the band in the early years knows who made these floats. I can't remember who it was. Don't think, I don't know. Anyway, it was sort of like a, a balsa body, a thin carbon stem and a cane bristle. But if you've got a round body, the rounder the body shape, then the more you can hold it without it riding out of the water. If you fish a float which is fairly narrow, just think about it, a float that's fairly narrow at the top, as you hold it, it will come out of the water, won't it? And so the rounder, if you've got a round body, then the, the, the flow is hitting the float above and below equally. So it sort of forces it down and so it, it does, it's not nowhere near as good as a flat float, but it's the best thing we had. But what you had to do, what we found on the band was you had to overshot the floats. Overshot them, so a bit, a bit like I've done, I, I, I've been doing it really all my fishing life on a flowing river. Don't know, I, I think probably Kevin taught me that, I should think. I don't know, don't know whether I taught myself or what, but, um, but I knew exactly how to do it, how to overshot a float so that the bristle tries to go under. Then you, it's the only way to slow a float down because then you hold it back, a bit like I, I did in Switzerland, and I spoke a bit about that on one of my earlier programs. You, so the float tries to go under and you hold it back. And depending on how much you overshot a float is how fast it goes through your peg. You can put enough shot on so you can almost hold it dead still. I mean, you'd have to put a load on, but you could put... So but if you so if you wanted it at a half pace, you'd have less shot than, than if you wanted to go at a quarter pace, you have to put, you have to put a little bit more shot on, or if you wanted two thirds pace, you put less shot on. So you have to alter it like that. And we were, the overshotting was by about two BB. So ah, just over a gram, Oversh overshotted about a gram, I suppose. I don't know what a BB is. I'm looking to see what a BB is in weight, but two BBs anyway, overshotted. And that was enough so that you could just, I'm trying to think of the pace. I'm guessing we were putting it through at half pace. That float and what you, what you would do, they would, I think we were using ah, probably number one droppers, three, three number one droppers, overshotting the float. The hook length was, ah, I'm trying to think, 25, 30 centimetres probably, at least 30 foot, th at least 12 inches, 30 centimetres, perhaps 40 centimetres, probably 40 centimetres. With all that 40 centimetres being on the bottom, no shot being on the bottom, but all those all the over all the uh, line on the bottom 20 hooks and uh, the bait was uh, a couple of bloodworms or a couple of bloodworm and a pinky I'll, once again i'll talk a little bit more about that but they the, the welsh lads were catching quite well you know so and i could just by looking you can tell when somebody's overshot in their float there was a rule in the in the world championships that 
<laughs> it's a stupid rule, the most stupid rule in the world. I don't know how you interpret it. People think that the rule was that you mustn't overshot your float, but it wasn't that. The rule was that the float mustn't impede the flow. So in other words, you couldn't hold your float at all, really. If you, but of course, everybody did. It was my cap straight now. So, um, so nobody took any notice, really. You, you put a float in and you'd hold it, wouldn't you? You'd try and, try and sort of stop it. But if you overshot it, you held it a bit more, um, which was the only way, really, to catch. And in practice, to be fair, in practice, Kevin and myself were, because we'd been brought up on the ban, we were doing really well in practice. And, and quite early on, Richard, the team manager, told us that we were in the team. But you're still fishing all the time to try and get in. Uh, and we, we worked at the, it, it was quite a simple method. The fish were quite way out. There was hardly any fish to be caught. There was these strange looking fish. They looked like a, they looked like a big gudgeon. And they probably weighed, well, oh, three, probably a hundred grams, somewhere about that. Uh, it, Kevin nicknamed them cigars. I don't know why cigars. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps he thought, perhaps, perhaps if you caught a fish, you lit a cigar up because you were, you, you were so delighted in catching it. That's a joke I heard from somebody else, actually. I think Clive told me that one. Um, but but there was this, they were strange looking fish, bottom feeding. They, they, they were a bit, a bit like a big gudgeon, I thought, uh, but they were, they were like a, a barbel gudgeon, would they be? Uh, perhaps, I don't know. Definitely a strange species. Might have been called a sterlet, but even that, I'm not sure. I'm hopeless and I sometimes remembering things. Anyway, match, um, we, we, so we worked out, that, and, and the fish were quite a way out to us. If you could, the further out you could fish, even in that pace, then the more chance you'd got of getting a bite. So minimum distance, really, most times we fished was 14 and a half metres to catch a fish. So it was quite, it was difficult fishing too. It was sort of, it was, what you had to do was, you got your, your float, overshotted float, so you, you go out with your float. We, I'll talk about the the pre the, the feeding earlier, the the, the actual pre baiting stuff. But but the actual catching a fish, you had to get out with your pole, so you've got your your float. Then you had to throw a small ball of ground bait, right? So you have to stand up. You've got your pole between your legs. That's the only way to feed. You stand up with your pole between your legs, and this reasonable sized ball of ground bait, sticky ground bait, we used then. I wish I'd have known more about gravel then, because that was the sort of place where you really wanted some gravel in your ground bait as well. But we had a sticky, we sponsored by sensors then, and all the ground bait was free. So we, we used their most sticky mix. It would probably have been a roach or something, but the stickiest, heaviest mix they had. And you had to throw this ball right just upstream of your float. So you could just, you had to work out in your mind where it was going to drop down, five and a half metres, dropping down in that flow, where will it finish? And then run your float, a little bit of joker and a few pinkies, a few maggots in the ground bait. And then, and then run your float down, holding it, and then you'd come back and you'd throw another ball. So it's technically very, very difficult because you 14 and a half metre poles back then not the same as a 14 and a half metre pole now. They were a little bit, quite a bit softer. Elastics, number eight elastic. That's about all we had, a six or an eight. But with a big float like that, you wanted an eight elastic at least in. And and you sort of, the pole, as I say, was, but we, we didn't, there wasn't a pole limit then. You could fish as long as you want. And luckily, I got the latest browning pole. Um, I have had a new browning pole probably every year for 30 odd years, so don't ask me the name of it because I won't be able to tell you. But they, luckily they had parallel butt sections and I had a 14 and a half metre pole. Didn't all go into one in those days. It sort of all went into 30 metres. Then you had another metre and a half section and then I had two extra parallel sections so I could fish at 17 metres. That wasn't easy, I'll tell you. That was... Well, it's okay. I was probably, uh, yeah, when you're sort of that age, you're pretty tough. Didn't didn't seem to affect me much. 
The hardest thing is when you've got to hold it and throw a ball of ground bait at that. So that was basically the technique was 10 gram floats, overshotted, and then uh, feeding a ball, really. That was the skill. That was the real skill factor. But do you know what? I... I think I derive a lot of my pleasure, fishing pleasure, from feeding, from having the knowledge of, of feeding accurately to get the fish, especially in flowing water, feeding accurately and getting the fish lined up so that, so that you've used your skill of feeding as well as the actual fishing side, so you combine everything. But I think if I... If I didn't, if I didn't feed, I wouldn't. I don't think I'd go fishing. I don't think I'd. I went. To, I, I, I had to go at trout fishing once. You know, casting a fly. And I didn't. I know I was catching because I went on. I don't know what they call it, Fool's Day or whatever. Because when they put a load of trout in and everybody catches them, Duffer's Day or something. I think it's called. And I, I, but I didn't really. I can't say that I really enjoyed it. I went, I've went. i been salmon fishing, trolling for salmon, and that's a bit different. You're moving a bit in the water with with different, but uh, I didn't. I love to feed, get the fish there. That's Whenever I go, I'm thinking about feeding. What am I doing? How can I get the fish lined up? How do you keep them coming? Do they move? So that's my, that's my pleasure that I get from fishing is feeding. Without feeding, I, I, I don't think I'd get the pleasure because it's, to me, it's not just about winning. I think you just ha you have to enjoy what you're doing. If it's only just about winning, I don't think you should be doing it. Personally, that's me. I think you should really. I derive pleasure from feeding and catching the fish. That's mine. That's that's really been the the secret of my success over the years. Feeding. I always say that. Anyway, uh, the unfortunate angler that got dropped was Dennis. You know, Dennis White, brilliant angler, and uh, Dennis White got dropped. He wasn't selected to fish, so he was reserve. So Tommy Pickering, the world champion from the, from the year before, was in. Kevin, of course, and myself, both with the experience of fishing on the band, so we knew what to do. Stevie Gardner, oh, just a brilliant angler anyway, Stevie. He'd been, he was another one that was... But he'd been brought up on the Thames, you know, he'd got a good idea. More with stick float and that sort of thing, but he'd got a good idea about all that sort of fishing. And, um, and of course, Mark Downs. Mark was the youngest member of the squad. You know, he's, in, he's now an England team manager, so he's, he's progressed and, and brought that with him. But Mark, had, Mark was picked. Mark's younger than me, and he was picked to fish for England uh, long before me. But he'd been in and out of the team. I don't know why, but he was. Anyway, he was, we, we, we had a really good side and, and England was just being successful at whatever they did. So let's go through match day. Match day comes and uh, I drew a peg in the middle section. Now it was a tough venue in practice. we. I think our best weight might have been six pound in practice, might have been, but that was with some blank pegs below because not everybody was there to practice. So we often had quite a bit of room to fish. But that method was the only method, was putting a big float through over depth with double blood worm or double blood worm and ping. That was the only way, only way. And the ball of ground bait, some balls at the start, but this is, so, the, so I, I drew this um, section. Uh, I don't know, might have been, might have been, let's see, the last I drew, he might have been C section or might have been D section, but it was in the middle part of the, of the actual river, uh, deep and, and fast flowing, you know. And, uh, now in world championships, as I said, with this world championship was over two days, two, three hour sessions. You get quite a bit of time to tackle up, hour and a half, perhaps might have been two hours. Where you get, you have to wait outside your box with your tackle. Mustn't go in it until a hooter blasts, and then you go in. You might have only had an hour and a half to tackle up. I'm not sure. Then you put all your tackle into your box, decide where you're going to position it in your ten meters because you can move it about. You're not. It's not like fishing in England where you have to sit exactly on your peg. You can move up and down in that zone. So you usually go. You would go to the upstream end of your box. 
so you give you the, the so you've given you the largest area to fish. You wouldn't sit dead in the centre of your box. You want to be upstream as far as you can get without going into somebody else's peg, uh, and somebody else's zone. So you put your position your box there, so you've got a nice long run down. And don't forget, you could if you feed properly. You can draw your fish from six pegs down. If, if, if you're feeding better or further out or more, more consistently than anyone else, because that, there's no rule about that, the fish can come up onto your feed and that's what you've got to hope to do. Hope to keep, that's what I said about feeding, topping your peg up. Um, initial plan was, I think about 10 balls in, uh, at 14 and a half metres, definitely at 14 and a half, that's without a doubt. There were some anglers that were fishing the first day this was, but we hadn't done this before. There were some anglers fishing at two metres just to catch some pegs right close in. There was a little tiny fish and it, it was difficult. So uh, we thought that there could be some blanks. Didn't ever believe that any of us would blank, but you never know. It was it was hard. So I put my, my, my 10 balls in and... There was nothing else to do really. It was quite quite simple. Bump 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 bump. Put your balls in with a few a bit of joker, not too much, and and a few pinkies. We didn't know anything about dead pinkies or. Oh, I know so much more now. Gravel, dead pinkies. Oh, I, I know so much more. Flat floats. I know so much more that would have caught me more fish on that day. But as it was, we were all in the same boat. Nobody really knew. Whistle goes and. Uh, have got any other pictures to show you? Let me have a look. No, no, I've got my last one. Um, and, and the match starts. And I'm at 14 and a half with that big float, 10 gram, overshotted. Knew exactly what to do from the start. Wasn't bothered at all. Just running it down, coming back, running it down. And uh, as I say, the, the main fish were these cigars, as Kevin had called them. Big gudgeon, about 100 grams, I think they weighed. Um, double blood worm. And... When you overshot that float, you just really want that. They're only, these were only small fish. You've got a big float, so you're not going to get much of a bite. So, But you want that bristle. If you can run it and just let, just run down with your pole and just, just with your bristle just above the surface and it's just so you can see any little dig, any little, anything strange, then bump, strike. Anyway, 20 minutes, bump. I mean, got me, uh, got me first fish, and uh, just, just careful. I netted it as well, and I know these counted, and and that was one of these cigars, hundred grams, uh, about hundred grams, just like it was, just like a big gudgeon. I knocked it, slipped in the net, and looking down, there's a Frenchman below me. He hadn't caught, and the lad on my right hadn't caught. I thought, oh, well, this is okay. Went through two or three more trucks down, it goes again. I've got another one of these sterlets. It looked exactly the same, looked like his twin brother or twin sister. I don't know, I can never tell a sex on fish. Some people can, can't they? But I can't. Put it, well, most people can, except me. And put it put it in my neck, two. And uh, and the first hour, I'd got four. That was mega. Still, the, the uh, Frenchman below me hadn't caught, and the French were really good at catching fish. They were the best, and um, and the and the angler on my right hadn't caught, and uh, I thought, oh, this is all right. And then uh, I don't think I saw Dick that day. He must have heard I was catching because it was really hard. And I thought, and I didn't get any more bites at that fourteen and a half. I thought, oh, I thought I've got to go out to sixteen. This is in the second hour, so I put another joint on sixteen. Out I go. And then, you know, 16 metres, you've got to throw that ball of ground, but you've got to be accurate. If anything, keep it slightly inside if you can. Don't try not to put it outside, but if you can, try to keep the, the ball of ground. But don't, oh, don't go really, don't want to go past your feed. If you do it, you only want to put one past that. You want to try and keep it on, really, it wanted to be online. You had to be pretty accurate. I was fairly good. At, Kevin was the same. We'd done it for, for ages on, on the band. It's exactly what we did. Ball of ground bait behind your float, held it and run it through over depth. It's just just like second nature, really. I was loving it, except, except the pole was getting heavier. And and uh, I caught uh, two, that next hour, it was getting hard. I caught two more. 
still, still, uh, then the Frenchman below me caught a fish. It was another, it was a sterlet, I think it was. A, and the angel on my right hadn't caught. So after two hours, I've got six fish. Now it doesn't sound like much, does it? Six fish, you know, six fish and 600 grams. It's not, not really a lot. And, uh, and then uh, I didn't get any more bites. So I thought, right, on goes that other section, 17 and a half. Now, the poles were nowhere near like they are now. So you can imagine at 17 and a half out there with this big flow on. And now I've got to throw my ground bait at 17 and a half running down and it's getting tougher and tougher. And I, I don't know, I've been out there about, I've probably been out, it's probably two and a half hours. The match float goes again. And another one of these, just like all the brothers and sisters, they're all the same size. Another one of these 100 gram sterlets or cigars or barbel gudgeon, whatever they were called. So I've got seven. When the whistle blew, I'd got seven of these fish. And I'm telling you, that was mega in my section. The Frenchman below me had one fish. Second weight in the section was somebody who had a roach that weighed 300 grams. I weighed 700, six or 700 grams, pound something. And, and I blitzed the section. But that was, that was a bit of knowledge of method, but six years experience fishing on the river ban in Northern Ireland, running that big 10 gram float through. I'd been doing it for years as if it was second nature. We never fished it. 17 and a half on the band, we didn't have to, Four, sort of 13 or 14 was plenty there. And uh, so I'd won my section, fantastic. Kevin, did Kevin, Kevin had a first and a second in his section. Yeah. I think the first day he'd won his section as well. Yeah, so we both won our sections. Can you believe though, and we had some really good results. Can you believe Tommy had blanked, Tommy Prickin had blanked. Champion from the year before, had blanked, hadn't had a bite, hadn't caught a fish. So that pulled us down, really. We were lying, probably lying second or third. Probably, I think we were lying third after that, that first day. So team-wise, it was a big blow. But individual-wise, Kevin, Kevin and myself were both won our sections. Both ban anglers, both had done brilliant in practice. Both knew exactly what to do. Uh, but Stevie had done well, he hadn't won his section, obviously, but, and, and, and Mark had done well. So it was, you know, it was, it was a good result, really. I mean, there was nobody that was, that was really bad, except Tommy. Tommy hadn't caught. And that, that's then, that's 20, I think there was 27 fishing then, 26 or 27. Then you get a, a you know, then you get, because you haven't caught, they whop another point on. So you got 28 points, poor Tommy, I think, and. So that was a disaster. But to be fair with Dick, he kept the team the same for the next day. Sometimes he'll put the reserve angler in. So Tommy probably, I mean, there was 24 blanks on the first day out of whatever. So it's out of a hundred and something anglers. So it was, it was tough for a lot of people. And my section, once again, I always seem to get the toughest sections. Why do you think that is? I think it's, I think if you're in a tough section, it's easier to win it, you know, if you know, if you know what I mean, it's easier, you know, no one else is going to be lucky enough to hook a big fish and beat you. I think if you're in a real tough section, so. And uh, I hadn't even thought about winning world championships. Not a thought in my mind at all about winning. And the next day comes and, uh, and then, and then, and I, this is another. Dick's drawn me. Dick has drawn me some. Richard has drawn me some brilliant pegs in my time. He drew me peg E twenty four. Now there was about twenty seven in the section twenty six, twenty seven, and that was right at the top end of the section. So that was the furthest upstream E section, and then it came down D C B, and A was the other side of that bridge that I showed you earlier. And, uh, and I got to me peg. I thought, well, I was looking and I thought, it's not flowing, it doesn't seem to be flowing so hard here. Just looking. And whether I was, something about the contour of the river or where it was, I thought, oh, I thought, this looks all right. But 
I checked, obviously you check, I checked where what came off my peg a day before, a Dutch angler was on it, blanked. So I thought, oh well, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying I'm used to that, I weren't bothered, because when I saw my peg, it was a lot steadier. And when I plumbed up, it was about, I think it was, I don't even think it was four metres deep. Probably, yeah, four, maybe, maybe about 12 foot, maybe a bit less than 12 foot deep and lovely and steady. So uh, I thought, oh, this looks good. And uh, and I put, you know, and I, I've got some other floats set up and I, I thought, oh, I'll put me lightest rig up, which was about four gram. I'd got one set up and I'd got four gram, six gram, you have up to 10 gram, but... I thought, well, it's not so deep here, and plumbed up four gram, and that was just slightly overshot it, not by much. I bet I only overshot it by, I don't know, not maybe a, maybe a number four shot, or maybe two number fours, and, and that just seemed to be going through, and it definitely was steady, and it was lovely. I thought, oh, oh this is all right. Uh, but same thing, 14 and a half metres, put 10 balls in, but we had we had, had a little change of team plan because of the, the fact that Tommy didn't catch, but, but he was still in the team the second day. We decided that there was some, Dick had spotted some anglers had caught fish at two metres, odd little tiny fish, just going out at two metres and running down. So team plan, always stick to the team plan, was that we would fish, start off fishing close in you know, to see if we could catch a fish, and if we didn't, then we could go out. And... So the whistle goes, goes on, and we put a little bit of feed in close, and I'll, <laughs> I'll run this, don't tell Dick this, but hey, I hope you're not watching, Richard. I, I run this, <laughs> I only run this little float through once. <laughs> I run this little float through once, I thought, well, that ain't no good, and I chucked it behind me up the bank, and I went out with 14 and a half metres, same as before, because I was... If you know, I'd caught the day before, I was confident, and but this was much steadier, four gram float now, not ten. Ball of ground bait behind the float, running it down, double blood worm running it around. It was lovely, lovely, comfortable fishing. Third run through, float goes, and a proper bite. I've got a roach. Oh, this is all right. Netted it out again, and I was another roach after about two, and, and, and I was catching quite steadily. I mean, it was. It was brilliant, really. It was it was fabulous fishing, and then uh, a catching really steady, same as before. Double blood worm, ball of ground bait, running it, running it nicely through, catching pretty steady. Not getting a bite every cast. I mean, don't get me wrong, it wasn't solid, but yes, compared to what I'd had before the day before, it was solid. And one or two nice roach as well, and then about. Oh, about an hour and a half into the match. Oh, this big fish. Oh. God dear. Oh, oh, you know, playing this big fish. Number eight elastic. The black. We used to use the black um, Preston then. Do you remember the black Preston one? It was the only one there was. And playing this big, big fish. And I knew it was a bream. I thought, oh, lovely bream. You know, played it, played it. Slipped the net under it. Um... And that's, I tell you what, but I still hadn't thought about winning the World Championship. Not even entered my mind. Netted this lovely big bream, I've got a roach. Looking round, nobody else is catching. <laughs> Honestly, they're catching odd fish, but you can't see nothing being caught. I thought, well, this is all right. I mean, I don't know. Why? why? I just think we knew what to do, English anglers. I think we knew how to catch the fish. And that, that was probably one of the easiest um, matches I've ever had that that second day on the river driver yeah just running it through catching another I think I've got an idea I hooked another fish and lost it but I might have just bumped and it, sometimes you can lose a foul look fish can't you? you don't know what they are I kept catching nice roach I don't think I caught any cigars that day I think they lived in the deep fast water and this 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 swim was a shallower steadier so it's got some roach and other fish in it and I ended up, what did I, I'm trying to think what I weighed. Mm, over two kilo anyway, which doesn't sound a lot, but honestly, that was a mega weight. That, I weighed in two kilos. One, well, Dick came along about, I think about an hour and a half to go. And I'd got, I'd just landed that big bream. And he said, you've won it, Bob. He said, you've won World Championship. He said, I can't see anybody else win, beating you. He said, because of your weight and everything. And I, I, I just... Then it sort of 
then it hits you. God, am I going to be... I can't explain the feeling for your first time. You know, you're with the team and you could be world champion. Can you imagine the feeling? You can't imagine it. Nobody can imagine it unless they're there. Unless they're there and experience it. I'm not... So I think I started to shake a bit then, you know, I think I was going out catching. And I think I just thought, oh, oh, anyway, carried on catching. It got a bit tougher, but I weighed in over two kilos, which was the top weight in the whole of the match. So, uh, you know, that's another, but it was, a, it was, a, I'll tell you the truth, it was a dolly peg. That's what I think it was, a dolly peg. I don't know how the Dutch angler didn't catch on the day before or anybody around didn't catch because it wasn't just the one peg. There was this slackish or small slack area it was over a few pegs. So it weren't just, it weren't just, it was impossible to get a slack area in one peg. It was on, must have been maybe, maybe where the river went round. I didn't really take note of the contours of the river, but there was a reason why it was shallower there was because there's not as much flow. You know, it's been there millions of years, isn't it? So millions of years, there's been less flow in that area, so it's shallower. Hey, and, and I'd won the section again. Kevin was second in his. He had a two and a one, so he, he got three points. So he was, and so Kevin finished second. Blimey, would he, can you believe that? Kevin was second, I was first. Um, good friend of ours, Jan Van Schendel, also was, I think he tied, he might have tied on points with a with another angler, but he was up there in the, in the top three. Now we didn't, and even worse, and I felt so, it, that that was the hardest part, I suppose. Tommy blanked again. Two days, two days on the run, not catching a fish. From being a world champion to not catching a fish. You'd think it was impossible, wouldn't you? So Tommy, Tommy's blank really cost us. He'd only got to catch a little fish one day. I think it ended up the French who were, it goes back to what I said, the strongest nations. The French, brilliant, always brilliant at, at, at catching fish anyway, small fish in particular. But they always could work out how to do it and they'd won it with 60 points. So, And then we tied with Italy on, what was it? Yeah, 89 points. So we tied with Italy on points, but we were second. We got a silver medal because of our weight advantage. We had more weight than Italy. So we got a silver medal that year. So we had a, I mean, it was great really, even though, oh, see, what can you say to Tommy? Nothing. I think I did hug him. I think I did hug him because I could have imagined how he felt and, you know, I'd won it. He'd won it the year before. And, so we were still got lots to celebrate, um, but we were second second team on the day, which still was okay. If you get in the medals, then you still go up for your medal, and it's still a great. Nothing ever works out perfectly for everybody, but for Kevin and myself, who had years of practice on that sort of fishing, I think it stood out. I think we were we were top in practice, and and we were top in the actual competition because we knew exactly what to do and how to feed accurately, feeding accurately and regularly to get the fish lined up to get them in your peg. That's, um, oh, there's a picture of me with my fish. With my, there, you can see my bream there. A few of the fish you can't see, but there's, <laughs> there's Bobby back in 1990. I haven't changed, have I, look? Go on, say I haven't changed. Well, I have, haven't I? So that, yeah, that was me winning the world championships. My first ever. Hearts pounding, you know, when you go up for, when they, when you go up for your prize, you're, you're pounding, people are cheering and, ah, oh, wonderful feeling, wonderful feeling. That was the start of my angling career, really. Winning, yeah, there, I suppose. We, we'd done other things, but, but winning my first ever world championship win in 1990 on the river driver mario Bor, yugoslavia now slovenia great well i oh, hey, i've been talking for ages this time hope you've enjoyed it i will be doing another one because i've got a few gold, more golden memories for you so look out for them whenever they appear but hope this one's kept you entertained thanks for watching
Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody.